Hello, can you hear me? Just put this away. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thanks to uh, Komato for your wonderful introduction. Uh, I don't speak the real, so I was really happy when I heard uh, Tamati was coming to speak and to open it uh, properly. Uh, so I'm always very thankful uh, when others can speak on my, on my behalf, coming from that generation when uh, just prior to when the school started to actually have a real taught in them, where we had our own schools and what have you, which was actually a driver of uh, one of the key reasons why I chose to come back to New Zealand uh, to take up a position at the University of Waikato, which I started in June after eight and a half years uh, in Australia. So my, uh, my four-year-old, my surprise, uh, for my partner and I, uh, could come back here and actually do the real and have that privilege uh, that so many of our kaumātua and kuia actually fought for. Um, reducing our prison population, past failures and new approaches. I've never spent so long uh, on thinking about and writing uh, notes for a, a talk as I have for this one, mainly because I had no idea what you were going to be like. Because <laughs> I'm used to lecturing, of course, and also speaking at, uh, at academic uh, conferences and, um, and practitioner-based conferences like the one I just spoke at uh, in Saskatoon, uh, Saskatchewan in, in, in Canada. So you're kind of, well, at least you think you know, yeah? You normally get two or three kind of uh, elements or components of the audience. And I, you're sitting around for a week and I have no idea what I'm in for. And you probably don't either, so that's all right. So we'll both start from the same, from the same position. Oh, that's all right. I'm, um, I do have the mic on, but... Right. So here we go. Before I start, I always start with a caveat. This is related to the position that I take. I uh, am considered by many, or I'm called a lot of things, so this is the nicest thing I hear about myself, as an activist academic. And I see it as my role to actually speak on behalf of not only Māori, but Ngā Murehu, the disaffected, the socially disadvantaged, Okay, so I put it out there, that out there right away. Okay, you are not going to be listening to a, an academic that claims any empirical objectivity to his position. That's not to say that my, the research that I don't do is not, as I believe, ethical okay, and empirical. Okay, but I do start from a position of wanting to speak on behalf of, of Māori and other disaffected okay, communities. All right, so just so that you know. Secondly... I am going to be controversial, I'm sure, for many of you in the, th in the issues that I'm going to raise and the statements uh, that I'm going to make. Please don't take it personally. Okay? Um, what I am intending here is to add, I think, at least my small, almost my small sort of uh, donation, if you like, towards the uh, process that the, the new government I was going to say the Labour government, but apparently NZ Fair supporters get really annoyed. So I think it's the, just call it the coalition government, okay, has started in relation to uh, the Minister of Justice, Andrew Little's um, uh, desire, stated desire, to have a critical uh, analysis of the performance of the criminal justice system with a view to what he calls, or he's called, significant changes necessary changes to make our system uh, more effective and effective meaning reducing reoffending, offending, reoffending and social harm, okay, and make it more just. Okay? So by way of that's anyway, those are the caveats here. So please don't take it too personally. I will be critiquing the policy industry and in the policy industry I'm talking about, yes, one of my ex colleagues that work in Parliament. Okay, down in the, uh, the, the, what we call the Lambton Key Triangle in Wellington, and the institutions of crime control. Okay, so if there's any people from Corrections and Ministry of Justice and Police in that here, yeah, this is not aimed at you personally. Man, I could, I could have that, I usually have about half an hour of caveats before I start. <laughs> so, so earlier this year, uh, the Minister of Justice, Andrew Little, as most of you hopefully will know, announced uh, the latest in what throughout my career has been, at least since about the mid to late 1980s, a long line of reviews, taxpayer-funded summits, inter-agency, whole of government, 
Uh, I do that because it's usually uh, uh, the same players that are involved. Projects that are aimed at making the criminal justice system work more efficiently and effectively. Uh, now, this was officially launched at a summit only a couple of months ago that was held in Porirua. Uh, and the stated aim of the review that the Minister has called is to reduce New Zealand's prison muster by about 30% over the next 15 years. I have some personal and professional views about that target, but I don't think I could use the language that I would usually describe it in an audience like this. Uh, ambitious, actually, is probably the most polite word that I could use. Uh, this is based on the fact that about uh, 10, 12 years ago, the Department of Corrections, through their minister at the time, announced that they were going to uh, actually attain a 15% reduction in the prison muster. Okay, and we didn't even get close to that. And here I come, and I'm in Australia, about ready to come back, and then they announced it's a 30% one. So you would understand my um, uh, apprehension at, uh, um, at whether or not they can actually achieve this. Anyway, enough about that. And in terms of announcing this review, a significant focus was called by the Minister on the significant overrepresentation of Māori in the prison population specifically and in the criminal justice system overall. Uh, I'm not going to focus entirely on the Māori, so-called Māori problem, okay, but I will allude to it every now and then, and this most especially uh, at the end. So, as I said in the beginning, the, my presentation, I think, hopefully will represent a, a modest offering okay, in response to the current government's attempts to, to make the system more effective and more just. Okay? Uh, before I move into the main part of the presentation, I want to say something about uh, my focus and the intent uh, of my commentary. Okay, so there are two key themes that will run through my uh, rhetoric. Uh, and hopefully we'll actually join the different elements together. Okay, and the first is that the policy sector, okay, the policy industry in Wellington primarily, and the political class that it supports, has had the lead for decades now in developing and implementing uh, responses to crime and more widely to social harm that occurs in our communities. It's fair to say, I think, that it's the impact of all this work has been mixed Okay, with as many failures as there has been successes, although given the lack of independent scrutiny of governmental activities that is allowed in New Zealand, this is a very subjective proposition that I am making, rather than a uh, fully empirical one. That's my academic way of saying we don't get to do much critical research on the activity or scrutiny related to the scrutiny of the performance of the criminal justice sector, and I'll actually deal with that at the end of my talk when I talk about what I believe are some of the necessary changes to the system. Yeah. However, regardless of its, uh, of its many failures, in my view, it is necessary part of any attempt that we make to actually reduce the prison population and so reform of the, poli uh, sorry, reform of the policy sector and of the political context of crime control policy development in New Zealand is absolutely necessary if we are to, in fact, meet this 30% target that the minister has set. Okay? And so I'm offering, I'm going to critique the performance of the policy sector, but hopefully with a view to, uh, not embarrassing, partly maybe, uh, persuading them okay, that it's time to, to change their ways, because I think they've had long enough. Okay? And actually formulating on our behalf responses to, to crime and, and social harm. So that's the first, if you like, theme. The second is that I believe any substantive move or moves to reduce the prison population requires a significant uh, increase or enhancement of the role that communities, which includes community-based service providers, okay, uh, the academic class, for want of a better term, and the development and delivery of policies and interventions that are aimed at reducing uh, criminal behaviour. The days of the wholesale importation of policies and interventions from other high crime jurisdictions like the United States, Great Britain, etc., okay, that has characterised the development and delivery of crime control policy in New Zealand since over the last 30 years has to stop. Okay, they need, this, needs, this type of strategy of responding to 
reducing social harm and crime in New Zealand has to change. There needs to be a reorientation of the by the political class and by the policy sector back to okay, uh, supporting our own providers and communities to develop and deliver uh, programs and interventions that are more suited to our social context. Okay? Whether that be Māori Pākehā, new migrant, those that work with Pacifica communities, etc. Okay, that's a very long introduction. So I'll get into the, uh, I've got a two-part presentation. And the first one I call politely overview of past re attempts to review criminal justice. Okay. So by way of background, uh, you heard my academic background, but before, in between starting lecturing at Victoria University in the mid-90s and going back to the academy in 2009, I actually worked in policy for 10 years. Okay, most of that time, about seven, seven and a half years, was spent at Te Puni Kukiri, Ministry of Māori Development, where I had the wonderful job, job I loved, of actually scrutinising crime control policy. So as you can imagine, I was very popular with, with the criminal justice sector policy people. Uh, and, I had, and I did a six-month sentence. It, was, was, it felt like a sentence at Corrections Head Office. Um, I actually was going to talk about that at length, and then I took all the notes out because I thought it might be a bit personal. Um, and, then I, and I did a bit of time at the Ministry of Social Development in two roles. One is an advisor on Māori and Pacifica research in the uh, research and evaluation unit within that ministry. And then for about 18 months, one of the best jobs I had in government was a regional policy advisor. I'm telling you this at length so that you know that I'm not just an, someone that went to school like most, some, not most, some academics, okay, that I've worked with, school, undergrad, postgrad, PhD, university, no one else would ever employ you, all right? Okay, so I actually worked uh, in the policy sector and I went there, ostensibly on a, firstly on a two-year contract so that I could actually find out the nuts and bolts and how policy worked so that when I jumped out of it, being an activist, I could critique them and they couldn't say, as often happens, well, you really don't know how policy works. But they paid me so well and I had so much fun critiquing at, when I was at Tapuni Kōkiri. I had, I had an insider's view that most activists and academics don't get. I was on the ground while policy, major policies and legislation was being formulated to see how they worked. In other words, I may be a bit unpopular with the policy sector in Wellington because they know that I know where the bodies are buried. Okay, I will use, so I just want to give you that background, I will use examples and case, study, case studies gained from my uh, policy and research experience to firstly highlight reasons, some of the reasons why I believe we have failed to arrest uh, the rate of imprisonment in this country, to fail to reduce in any meaningful uh, measure the harm that occurs from crime and victimisation that occurs in our communities. Uh, or to eradicate bias and racism, which unfortunately does exist uh, in our criminal justice system, despite what the Commissioner of Police may say about unintend, uh, un unintended bias. Unconscious bias, sorry, I'll talk about that too. Two, I want to, I want to utilise these case studies and examples to evidence my key argument for a significant overhaul of the policy industry and a reduction in the political class's influence on crime control policy without which any significant reduction uh, in crime and social harm and use of imprisonment is impossible. Okay, so, when I did my six month stint at Corrections, this is the first example, I uh, moved there in um, 2001, I'd just done two years at, uh, sorry this yeah, creaking is interesting, sorry, it's, I'll try not to move, I tend to move right, so I'll try and, I'll try and keep still. Okay, so I arrived anyway at Corrections in 2001. And right at that point, is anyone from Corrections here? Oh, cool. You're going to love this bit. Okay, they just started to implement integrated offender management. Okay, now I know it's all, I know it's all slightly changed now. It's different from then. But anyway, I'm just using this as an example. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I actually think that this case study encapsulates uh, all that was is wrong with crime control policy sector in New Zealand. Yeah, I remember before I said they do some things right and they have some successes. Oh, I'm not actually going to highlight those. Why? Because the corrections and MOJ and the police are really good at telling us how fantastic they are. They have, poli uh, uh, I'm gonna, you're gonna pick on you now. The corrections have their own policy journal in which you know, they, they tell us how wonderfully successful their programs are, blah, blah, blah. 
the police have all their marketing. So I'm, that's not my job, all right? They do it themselves. Yep, cool. So anyway, so in relation to the integrated offender management, it was evident, um, and, and why do I think that it actually encapsulates all that was wrong with the way in which we develop crime control policy in Wellington? And it was evident from when I first started that senior management was hell-bent on introducing the process, uh, regardless of any criticism, any dissent, any critical, uh, external critical uh, analysis, which, of which there was very little because they were very good at protecting um, the, the product and themselves from any external critique. And I, for that reason, I found, uh, coming from TPK, that the consultation with internal, external stakeholders was highly superficial. Generally kind of like the tick the box exercise uh, that uh, is, uh, community groups are highly critical of in relation to government so-called consultative processes, yeah? When what we want is engagement, yeah? We want, we want two-way dialogue. And, and generally this is not what played out in relation to the integrated offender management program. I personally attended three of these uh, community consultations. Uh, and after I read, because I was in the policy sector as an advisor, the policy team, sorry, I then read the reports that were written thereafter. And, and in each one of these reports, the criticism, the critique that I heard of not only corrections, but the wider criminal justice sector, they either were excluded, they didn't appear in those reports, uh, or they were reworded, uh, that thus to enable, in my view, the department to answer the, these toned down, altered critique uh, from preconceived, of preconceived suite of answers. Now, just so that I can take this away from just criticising corrections, that was generally the consultative uh, process that all, each one of the major crime control institutions carried out during my 10 years in government. And when I was at 20 Corkett, it used to really drive us crazy. Because what, what would happen, you see, is because we, uh, we were mandated under legislation to be the uh, primary advisor to government on Māori issues. So every one of these, um, these departments were now told by Cabinet, or by the Minister, go and speak to Māori, or Pacifica, or whoever, about key issues. They would come to us and say, could you guys do, go, and, uh, go around and organise all our hui for us? which we hated because we, we were hui hopping okay, on behalf of all these other agencies. Uh, and why was it annoying? Well, you might, you might say, well, that's your job. But actually, it wasn't. Right? Our job was actually critique their, their, um, their activities, not to go around holding their hands and doing all their, their consultative work for them. But why it was embarrassing was because they generally, their consultation was of this kind that I'm describing, which was not the mahi at the, at the piri kōkiri, and it was certainly not the tikanga in relation to how we engage with, with communities. Anyway, okay. okay. So that's one, one issue. Two, uh, basically what the uh, IOM uh, represented was the wholesale importation of a process that was developed in Canada, okay, into the New Zealand context. And what to me was a key theme that ran through that implementation when you read the uh, policy papers and implementation uh, processes that were put in place by uh, the policy managers and the policy workers in corrections was um, the, a liberal use of what I think most ac accurately can be called orientalization. Now I'm going to, I will, I couldn't think of another term, orientalization of the social context with regards to the potential impact on the process on Māori. Orientalisation is a wonderful concept developed by the Palestinian social theorist Edward Said in the late 1970s. And Ed Said, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, he coined this term to describe how the Portuguese, the English, and everyone went into the Orient or Southeast Asia, couldn't be, just couldn't handle the fact that there were just so many cultural contexts and languages, and it's created this overarching one-size-fits-all Ethnicity, for want of a better term, the Orientals. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me explain. This importation exercise of ION came up against one really particularly significant policy problem, us. All right, we are treaty partners, we have the right to be consulted, not only to be consulted, but in actual fact for any type of process like this when it's implemented, to be able to, uh, how do I put this, reflect our social and cultural context, yeah? So what they did was basically ignore that. 
and they orientalized it by basically, and I was in, policy, in meetings within corrections when senior managers would turn around and go, well, if you look at the uh, uh, components of the Canadian exercise in integrated offender management, they did research that showed, for example, that the integrated offender management process worked really well for black Canadians. And so therefore, it should be okay for Māori. This is what they meant by Orientalism. In this case, black, black Canadians are coloured, Māori are coloured, so therefore it'll work for Māori. If you think that I'm exaggerating, a couple of years after this, I'm called to a presentation at MSD, Ministry of Social Development, by a professor in psychology from the United States, who I won't name to, embarrass, so to save him embarrassment because he's still working, who was over here uh, selling a, um, what do you call it, a um, wraparound program, psych-based program for youth called multi-systemic therapy, some of you may have heard of. And during his presentation, one of uh, Minister Tariana Turia's staff went, but how do you know that it's going to work for Māori? given that we actually already have our own wraparound tikanga-based systems, and he said, well, research tells us that it works for African-Americans and Hispanics. Uh, the fact that I then pointed out kind of different social, cultural, and by the way, you know, kind of uh, colonial context. We're straight over. <laughs> anyway, carry on. That's orientalization. Sorry to use. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think what reflected this exercise poorly was what I was the dominance of policy-based evidence. Right? Policy-based evidence. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment. As opposed to now, some of you, those of you especially who work with uh, government agencies, will hear them talk about, and even social, uh, social support or social delivery agencies, yeah? will hear, hear the term evidence-based policy, yes? So we develop policy based on empirical evidence of the impact, effect, and, and what will work. What the ION example uh, provides us is, is a, uh, I think, one of the key issues that has stopped us from actually developing effective interventions in this country. And that is, in fact, is often it's the reverse. The, it's policy-based evidence, okay, uh, in which basically the agencies will decide, or the politicians who direct the agencies will decide, I want this policy, yeah? and the job of the policy workers is to find the evidential base to it. When you are directed, I want this policy, and I'll talk about a classic example in a moment, which is boot camps, yeah? uh, then you go and you cherry pick different types of policy, uh, evidence to support your preconceived, politically directed crime control policy or legislation. Yeah? Okay. Just one more thing about IOM. I have to tell, this is a great story, so I've got to tell it. <coughs> I, w I lasted six months at corrections. I couldn't handle it. Well, they couldn't handle me. I think it was, you know, a divorce by mutual agreement. So I went back to Tupuni Kōkiri, and when, not long afterwards, a couple of years later, uh, the, the department were getting ready for analysis and release of the first tranche of data from its suite of criminogenic programs. For those of you who don't know, criminogenic programs are those programs, um, interventions based around what are seen as the three or four primary drivers of criminality, right? Uh, cognitive uh, issues, not being able to think properly and reason, yeah? uh, drug and alcohol, anger, and you know, those kind of things, right? And so under the ledgers, under the when they got all millions of dollars from the government, the government said, that's cool, but after a few years, we want you to report back on what you're doing. What well, in fact it has, right? <coughs> so while I was there, they had announced, um, they'd gotten these experts in, Andrews and Bont and all these other experts in, in criminogenic needs and, and development of those types of programs from Canada and the United States. And, they had, and I remember when I was there, they announced, we've got the gold stamp, okay, on our, on our data gathering and analysis uh, program. I loved this. I was at Tupuni Kōkiri, and one of our mates rang up from Corrections and said, uh, you, guys, you guys need to know this, but the first tranche of the analysis of the first suite of uh, data came through, and the programs aren't looking too healthy. 
in fact, straight thinking, which was the cognitive therapeutic uh, program and one or two others, in fact, what the data, he said, the initial data showing us is that Māori that, re that, that received, that didn't receive these programs, like the control group, yeah, had lower reoffending rates than the offenders that went through <laughs> the interventions. Yes? And we were like, yeah, so when's this going to come out? Well, it's not, because, and, and this is, uh, I think, sometimes leads to this whole issue of policy-based evidence as well. They were forewarned by, uh, by some in the psych unit, in the psych uh, uh, policy unit within corrections at the time, by a number of Māori staff and, and, and in group, uh, sorry, and practitioners they brought in on the advisory group, that there was a possibility that these programs, as they were being imported wholesale, to, to, uh, from a, uh, if you like, much better, for want of a better term, Eurocentric Canadian uh, paradigm, would not work, and they ignored it. They ignored this critique as they did much of the critique, yeah? And so we thought this was great, except the, 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 uh, the poor post-grad student from Victoria University that they contracted to write this report and do the analysis suddenly found it taken off him and see you later, gave it over to one of their policy wonks and head office to, to apparently reanalyze, or as we called it, TPK, rewrite and hide, right? Uh, and anyway, so someone who I had no idea who it was let one of the New Zealand's first um, members of parliament at the time, I have no idea who did that, uh, that this was being hidden and there were questions in the, 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 the correct, hey, what, what makes you think it was me? Uh, the criminal justice select committee and suddenly this became known and they, they come forward and said, yeah, yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, they may, we may need to tweak some of our programs. Okay, may need to tweak some of our programs. There was a point where I went into that story Oh yeah, because not long after, a year or two after this, the department, I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still on corrections, I'm really giving my hammering, eh? Uh, why it's important, not only to Māori, but to those who work in the, social, the community uh, service, social service um, industry, so to speak, or delivery of social services in the community, it was a couple of years later, uh, they wanted to, corrections wanted to look at if they could actually centralise, okay, uh, the service delivery that at the time was being contracted out to community groups. Does that make sense? And so all sorts of weird and wonderful things were happening, like these far north, there were some Māori providers up there that suddenly found themselves having a formative evaluation of their programme. Now, a formative evaluation is not an outcome-based evaluation. It's one where are you, you know, writing out your monthly reports properly? Are you tracking your customers and clients, yeah? They don't tell you that the programme's actually reducing, say, your offending. You know, the big targets. And then, and then found, on the basis of these formative evaluations, because there was a few problems, they suddenly lost their contracts and what have you, which I thought was totally unethical, um, because they should have been based on whether or not they were actually you know, reducing harm and all the rest of these major ones. Anyway, a couple of years later, I was at a, um, a, a, a gathering similar to this, and there was a panel, and there were some uh, senior managers from uh, corrections were defending this practice and how these because they were challenged by a number of particularly Māori community providers about how they'd lost their funding. And this policy manager yelled out, said, well, you know you failed the evaluation. So I responded to say, well, actually, they refailed. They, they, they had issues with a formative evaluation. We have evidence a couple of years ago that your programs weren't working. So when are you guys going to stop using them and hand back the 50 million or so that you've had the last five years? And of course, the answer was, it's not the same thing. I said, well, you know, we've got actually got more substantive evidence that your straight thinking and other cognitive therapeutic programs were doing harm to Māori or not working as well. Right? So how come there's one rule for you and a rule for everyone else? Anyway, okay. Um, so the rise of, of, of this example I'm giving of IOM, and Integrated Offender Management, uh, coincided with the revolution within New Zealand's policy sector, okay, which was uh, where in science and evidence uh, became the basis, or supposed to become the basis for policy making. This is the evidence-based evidence policy making that I spoke of earlier. Okay, this was supposed to, to frame the development of effective interventions and to guide uh, cabinet, the departments and cabinets to make decisions about where to put their resources, yeah? where to put their putia, their money, our money. Right? Or at least that's what the policy sector told itself and everyone else. Okay, uh, in the public from the early 2000s onward. Now, 
quite often in my experience this has not been the case. Um, with pertinent evidence being either totally ignored or the evidence that suits a predetermined policy outcome favoured over you know, the messy stuff, like for example evidence that contradicts the cabinet minister's pet project or, or that highlights the negative impact of government social and economic policy. Yeah. So, and the recent classic example of this was the uh, resurrection by the previous government of boot camps. You all know about boot camps? Yeah, yep. militaristic style uh, programs for youth offenders. When this idea was mooted in the late 2000s, there was no firm evidence existed in any Western jurisdiction to indicate that this intervention actually results in positive outcomes the youth, excuse me. But it was implemented regardless. Why, you may ask? I'll tell you. Because the minister wanted it. And the minister and the national government at the time wanted to look tough on crime. All right? Wanted to appeal to, to our fear of young people and of youth. Youth out of control, etc. You know, these kind of um, myths that surround youth culture in, in Western countries like ours. Okay? Um, so in other words, you know, the answers are why was it implemented was one, populist pop politics, and secondly, ideology. This goes completely against the claims by policy sector and even some parliament politicians that they will only fund or implement evidence-based interventions. Okay? And yes, sometimes this does happen. I'd say actually probably is the, uh, is the most common policy process. The problem is in this across the social sector, but in criminal justice, it is oft, because, it is so, because crime, social harm is so political and it's a fantastic vote winner, okay, this policy-based evidence process happens far too often and far more, though, I would say, than other areas, or other um, uh, policy sectors like health and education and what have you. Yeah. So to understand how such a poorly performing crime control intervention, such as boot camps, could actually be, end up being introduced, you have to uh, ignore the rhetoric that we hear from Wellington that New Zealand's, often that New Zealand's policy sector is apolitical, that it's neutral. Okay? And that policy decisions are always or often based on scientifically uh, derived evidence. This is often not the case in this sector. The introduction of boot camps was purely ideological of the get tough on crime, uh, bring back military style discipline for those young thugs and uh, good thrashing, never did me any harm kind of approach to social policy and in relation to the correction of youth offenders. Now to their credit, the Ministry of Justice officials at this time provided their minister with a thorough briefing, one that highlighted the lack of evidence that the intervention would in fact make us safer and reduce youth offending but nonetheless, the minister moved forward with the policy and he actually wrote on, I, I'm, I'm having a blank at the moment, I can't remember his name. He's not in parliament anymore. He actually noted on it simply that he had received but not read the briefing. Yeah? And, and I'm not, this is evidence. This is, you can actually get a copy of it through the OIA, the Official Information Act, and you can read this. I'm making this point because it might sound superfluous or superficial, but it's actually important. He's given a briefing by his own ministry, which in my view, in my experience, is quite a conservative policy shop in relation to crime control, who I think, when I read their report, did in actual fact a fantastic job of pointing out the evidential uh, issues with this policy, and he d d deems it not worth reading. Why? Because he already made up his, his mind, his, the decision. This is political, okay? This uh, problematizes the claims that come out of Wellington out of the political class, Okay, that it is evidence and science that drives policy sector or policy making in this particular area. So I wish to be clear about uh, one thing at this point. Sometimes evidence uh, has, does have a significant impact on policy development and implementation. My argument here is sometimes it does not. And when it doesn't, it can actually be quite damaging. It can stop us from actually creating effective interventions and responses to social harm and to crime. But sadly, I have to report, and I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of knobs, so some of you obviously have experienced this through your you know, life experience or your jobs, 
A policy process can be and often is highly political and ideological. With interventions and policies influenced as much by who a minister was drinking with last week as it is on independent empirical evidence. I, I, I'm not being uh, unfair, unkind in talking about politicians that way because when the 2002 um, uh, review, if you like, of the um, sorry, Sentencing Act, review of the Sentencing Act was being carried out, I was in a meeting with a then very prominent Labour Minister of Government, okay, you may, who's now a very prominent uh, politician in Auckland, who and I overheard him talking about two things. One is, I was at the local RSA last week, there's no disrespect to return servicemen, please. Okay, and one of them suggested this, what a wonderful idea, I want you to take that forward. Ideas from all sections of the community are welcome. All right? That was the forerunner about seven or eight years later to National introducing boot camps. Okay? Oh, the other thing that they said, what was the other thing he said? Oh, when, when I pointed out the impact of, for example, taking away suspended sentences, which is one of the key drivers of our significant increase as being empirically tested in our prison muster, he said, well, the thing is, anything that I include in the 2002 Act must pass the, um, what's that body? Oh, damn. Um, uh, truth and sentencing. Sensible sentencing trust. Anyone from the Sensible Sentencing Trust here? Oh, I saw a half hand somewhere. Yeah, 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 that boy. Um, who was the leader who just retired? Sorry? Garth McVicker, yes. I'm really sorry you can tell that I've, I've a, I have a four-year-old who was annoying the hell out of me at three o'clock this morning, and two, just come back eight and a half years. Anyway, Garth, he called it the McVicker test. I said, it's got to pass the McVicker test. <coughs> Didn't pass the Tupini Kōkiri one test, but then we didn't matter because we don't, we're only two votes, yeah? Okay. I'm realising that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go forward a little bit. So, so the policy, well, the political class is biased, yeah? They're biased in terms of they want your votes and they will say and do whatever it is to get those votes. And, they, and in this sector, they play on our fear, the fear of the other, whether it be brown people, poor white people, young people generally. Yeah. Uh, but the policy sector, because they're so wedded to the political class, are biased too. Okay. And they have their own worldview. They have their theoretical paradigm that drives their development of their policy. In corrections, it's the psychology of criminal conduct, highly individualised, Eurocentric kind of way of thinking about how crime or social harm occurs, which is highly problematic to me because it, it, it by its very nature, turns attention away from the social construct, yeah? From wider in the impact on individual conduct of things like, for example, the precarious economy that we now have. A lot of our young people are going into jobs, okay, uh, zero contract, I think they call them, okay, in which uh, it's very, very difficult for them to earn enough to eat and to put roofs over their head. Yeah? These social structural drivers of criminality and poor behaviour or whatever it is, poor social outcomes, okay, are not included or are downplayed in this type of theoretical paradigm that drives crime control policy in New Zealand. Just for an example. Okay. I, I, I was trying to formulate an idea about how to explain what I see as the crux of the problem, right? and I've come up with this concept of the policy bubble. The policy bubble. This is one of the things that annoys me about the criminal justice sector itself and its behaviour in terms of development of Policies. I think a lot of those, what they tell us about what they can actually achieve or are trying to is actually quite deceitful in many ways. Okay? There are a number of issues and factors that play a role, I think, in the overall poor quality of policies and interventions that are sometimes produced by the policy industry and crime control sector. And combined, they result in this thing that I call the policy bubble. And what is this bubble? This, uh, this relates to or occurs from the exaggerated claims of success by the sector in the, in 
the face of inevitable catastrophic failure of policy and interventions. All right? I'm greatly exaggerating what they're doing. What they're doing, you want me to, to basically not exaggerate, is they are telling you one story knowing full well that they're not going to reduce, make you safer. Okay? The crime control sector of itself will not reduce the prison muster. 